an objective that becomes the focus of our life. I'm sure we've all seen the James Bond films. James Bond, you know, he's called up and he's given a mission to do, to save the world normally, whether it's, I don't know, to rescue Blofeld's cat or to get gold or whatever it happens to be. A mission is one of those things that is, it's so important, it actually occupies the whole, your whole life. Can you imagine James Bond having three distinct missions? Okay, so he's trying to rescue someone over here, and at the same time, he's trying to do something else. No, that's not the way it works. The mission is so important, it becomes the focus of everything that you do. You might get involved in different activities and different locations, but, you know, the objective remains the same. It is the focus of what you do. You know, the word mission itself, and as has been mentioned earlier, we're going through a series of talks really about missions, and in particular, the Christian mission. And mission, the word mission sounds really important, doesn't it? Mission. I'm on a mission. You know, if you want someone to go out and get you the milk, say, look, I need, I've got a mission for you. <laughs> Somehow, it sounds far more important than, can you go up the shops and get a pint of milk? No, I have a mission. Because in this mission, you will save us from hunger tomorrow morning, or whatever that happens to be. You know, the word mission is so important. It conveys so many different things. Organizations in the business world, most of them have mission statements, all right? And a mission statement describes what the organization exists for, what its purpose is, and what it hopes to achieve. And I've got some mission statements here for you from some organizations. See if you can work out what uh, the organization is from this. Here we are, this. To be our customer's favorite place and way to eat and drink. Whose mission statement do you think that is? McDonald's. McDonald's over there. Well done, McDonald's. Here's another one. To save the world from mediocre coffee. It's Costa. It's not Starbucks. It's Costa. Well done. How about this one? Listen out, Paul. To create and build beautiful fast cars that bring the enjoyment and exhilaration of driving to life. Jaguar. <laughs> How about this one? To provide care and services that we and our families would want to use. The NHS. Well done. I didn't think you'd get that one. You see, the importance of a mission statement is that supposedly it drives what you do. Everything, your activities, what you plan to do is all driven from what your mission is in life. And here's the question for all of us. What is our mission statement? What is the mission that we were born to that is important? What is it about us that defines what we do and what we want to achieve in life? You know, many people don't have mission statements. You know, life just comes and ebbs and flows day in, day out, and there's no real structure to it, or so it seems. And unfortunately, a life like that can be so um, unfulfilling. And yet, those of us who are Christians... Those of us who have given our hearts to the Lord, you know, God says, I've got a mission for you. You know, and that mission is to save a lost world. That mission is to carry on the work that Jesus started when he walked around healing people, telling them the good news about God. And in some ways, that we carry on that, um, that mission. But does it drive everything that we do? Is it the complete purpose of our life. Michael mentioned in his, week, uh, in his preach two weeks ago, Michael Collins says, you know, quite often when we use the word missions in a church context, we talk about missionaries. You know, those people who are set apart from the church and usually we, they're sent abroad and they go and live in abject poverty, in mud huts or whatever it is, and, um, you know, and they're there trying to heal the sick in those places and spread the good news about Jesus Christ. 
And so often, as me, when I was growing up, you know, to me, missionaries were exceptional people. There were just one or two people in the church who aspired to those places, and we would raise them up as churches, and I'm not saying anything wrong with this, by the way, but we would raise them up as pinnacles. They are the people. They are missionaries. You know, and our involvement with the rest of the church was that we were there to support them financially and to read the magazines when they came in. That was our job. And yet, missions and missionaries is so much more than those things. If you'd like to turn me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. You know, the Bible has the reason, if like, has the purpose for our lives in it. And I do recommend, I do urge you, you know, do read your Bible, you know, and do check out what's forever preached from the front, that what we're preaching is actually right, because, you know, the Bible is our guide to life. So Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And um, quite a familiar chapter, this one. So it says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In this Bible passage, we have what they call the fivefold ministries, the gifts given to the church. They are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Where are the missionaries? Surely someone's missed something else. Surely there's a gift of the church of missionaries, and yet it's not here. Why is that? Because it's what the rest of us does. We are all missionaries. You know, and God has given those gifts in the church to build the rest of us up so that we can carry out the mission. We are missionaries to the people where we live. And um, Acts 1 has already been spoken about this morning. I'd like to turn to Acts 1 and verse 6. Thanks, Twain, for that. <laughs> you know, but it's so true, you know, these, these scriptures. And Acts 1 verse 6 is when Jesus got his disciples and his followers together just before he went back to heaven. Another very well-known verse. It says, And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father set by his own authority. But you, and he's talking to all of us here this morning, all of us that love him, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you. What for? So that we can speak in tongues? So that we can impress our neighbors? No, it says, so that you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses missionaries. It's the same thing. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Bible makes it clear that we are all missionaries. And last week, um, Christiana spoke about how we could be missions or on a mission or missionaries to our close, like to Jerusalem in that scripture. Those people round about us, our friends and our families, And today I want to talk about how we can take the next step out to Judea. You know, how can we then spread and be missionaries to our local area? And in particular, I want to talk about how can we be missionaries to this area around the church or around the area where you live? How do we branch out and reach that particular group of people? I'd like to start off by saying that a missionary isn't just about doing good things. You know, things like the, um, the homeless shelter that we run during the winter or make lunch that we do during the week. They are good things, but they are not the entire mission. You see, the entire mission is about doing good things and telling them about, if like, uh, spreading the good news, 
that they have a loving father, to let people know that they are loved by God and there's a God who wants to reach out and touch them. You see, that is a complete mission. It's when we, that objective in mind is to bring people to Christ, to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus. And good works that we do, they are there to grab the attention. They are there to help people in desperate need where they are, but it's only the introduction to where to introduce them to our Heavenly Father. At the heart for the house meeting that we had a few weeks ago, um, you know, the, the elders, ships, and the trustees were talking about that really the focus of the church is to reach this surrounding area where we are, whether it be over the Dickens estate, the Westcourt estate, down Damocus Road. How, and I was thinking, if Jesus was in this place today, if Jesus if like, was the head pastor today in this church, do you think there'd be much of an impact on the surrounding areas? I, I, I think so, don't you? And yet, we are all called to be like Jesus, where we are. So how do we make that impact in the surrounding areas? You know, we can approach our mission in the same way that Jesus did. It's interesting, when you look at Jesus, most of his mission, in fact, I would say perhaps all his mission, took place outside the church. There were just one or two things that he did actually inside the church. But for most of the time, he was outside the church. So if we're going to reach our neighborhoods, then we need to be outside the church. And if you look at the way Jesus approached mission, there were three sort of steps that he took that I want to just take you through now. And the first one is this. We need to be interested in people. But I'd add one more. We need to be interested one person at a time. So often we think of missions about having some kind of big crusade where we invite people in, say, you're out there, but why don't you come into us? Come into us, and then we'll blast the gospel at you, and somehow you'll get saved, and that we'll all go and celebrate. That's not how Jesus did it, by the way. <laughs> Jesus went out of the place, and if you look, pretty much all the time it was one person at a time. Yeah. It was usually somebody in need. And so the first thing that we need to do, we need to be interested in people. In Philippians 2 and verse 1 to 4. Again, this is a scripture we had a few weeks ago, but it's so true for this morning's. Philippians 2 and verse 1 says this. Does your life in Christ give you strength? Does his love comfort you? Do we share together in the Spirit? Do you all have mercy and kindness? If so, make me very happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same love and having one mind and purpose. When you do things, do not let selfish or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honour to others than to yourself. Do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. Our mission to the surrounding area starts with us being interested in the people who live there. I wonder... Do we realize or do we remember that every person we meet was created by God for a purpose? That God loves them just as much as he loves you and me, irrespective of what they have done. He still loves them and he has a plan and a purpose for those people out there. And so often we tend to say, oh, well, they're, they're just uneducated or, or, or whatever, and we dismiss them. And yet we, we fail to realize that there's a God who has actually a plan for them. And part of our mission is to introduce them to a God so they can find out what that plan is for themselves. You know, our role as missionaries is not to judge people. <laughs> our role is actually to reach out and connect with them. I wonder... Do we know anybody in the surrounding areas? Do we know what the local issues are that are going on in the houses round about us? 
Do we know what their situation is? Do we know of their fears and concerns that they have as a neighbor? Do we know that? I know some of you do because you live there. <laughs> okay, but do we know that? Because if we don't, how can we ever possibly hope to reach our neighborhood unless we know what concerns them? If all our experience is actually attending, for example, this place in here, and we never go outside, how can we ever hope to reach them? So the first thing that Jesus did, he was interested in people. He went outside. No, it didn't matter whether they were tax collectors, whether they were beggars, whether they were rulers. It didn't matter. Jesus was interested in them personally. The second step is that Jesus was concerned for them. Once you've made that contact and you start talking with people, is what fears do they have? Are you concerned? Have you ever met someone, perhaps you did it this morning when you came into the service, you come in and you say, oh, how are you? Hoping and praying they weren't really going to tell you. <laughs> or, or they were just going to say, oh, I'm well. Whew, that gets me off the hook. I can go on to the next person. I wonder, has anybody ever come up to you and said, how are you? And inside you're hurting. And as you start to share your heart with someone, you say, I've actually had a bad week this week, you know. And you start to describe it, and they say, oh yeah, I had a week like that as well. And then they start telling you about all their problems. You say, hold on a minute, I thought this was about me. <laughs> and suddenly it's swapped around, it's now all about them. You see, when you're concerned with someone, you're really concerned about them. You're concerned about their actual situation. And you're not going to start telling them about your problems and your woes or how you overcome it. Instead, Jesus was always concerned for the people involved. The Good Samaritan that we spoke about so, no, during, the, uh, during the offering is a great example. There was somebody who saw someone in need and he was concerned. And by the way, that led him, his concern led him to take step three, which is the third step. Okay, and... That led him to actually be good news. So once we're concerned with somebody, once we've met them, once we find out where their, where their situation is, once we are concerned, we are driven to do something about it if we can. And that is to be good news. And to me, there are two parts to being good news. The first part is practical help. What can I do now that will help them. Sometimes that's just listening. Sometimes, I mean, us guys, we do like to fix things, don't we? We like to think we've got a solution in our pocket somewhere. And I, and I guess our, our wives are always telling us, no, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you, you can't fix this, but instead I want you to listen. Sometimes we can do things. Sometimes, though, we're of the mind of saying, well, something can be done, but that's someone else's responsibility. I believe, you know, if we're really concerned, then it's now our responsibility. Concern will drive us to do whatever we can. Sometimes it might be connecting people with other agencies who can help. But that's only the first part. The second part is to then connect, be good news in, on the spiritual side. You see, all of us are two parts. There's our body, and there's the bit that lives inside the body, us. The spiritual side. And that needs help as well. That needs to good news. To point them to that there's a God who loves them, who knows about their situation, and who wants to restore them to their purpose in life. The two go together. The practical help and the spiritual help go together. Now, there are many things that go on inside this church which are there to really reach our, our neighborhood. And perhaps some of you in the church, and perhaps you're listening online, you say, well, well what does the church actually do? Well, as many of you know, is that um, we only have temporary planning permission in this building. And that temporary planning permission runs out uh, later this year. Um, it's that when we came here, that's all we could achieve. However, we were told that if you, if, if you behave yourself for four years, which hopefully we have done, okay, <laughs> Then apply for permanent plan permission, and you should get, and you'll get it. And we're praying we're going to get it, by the way. 
Um, but as part of that, we have to write a statement of what does the church stand for and what does it do. And I, I'd like to read to you what that statement that went in this week, by the way, to the council. And it's, it's written from a third-party point of view. So someone looking at us. So this is what um, the church planning statement is. The church's focus and outreach to the, is to the local communities of Westcourt, Dickens, and Damagos Road. This is reflected in the activities carried out on the site, which have been well received by those local communities, which include city youth, that takes the form of an after-schools club where ages 12 to 21 can eat, play games, and talk various life skills. Young adults, which is aimed at 21 to 30s to bring them together. Parent and toddlers, that takes place midweek and takes the form of a play area and information on all aspects of parenting. Make lunch, where lunch is made and distributed to local families in the area. This initially came as a response to the pandemic lockdowns, but will continue for the foreseeable future. Pastoral care in the area of marriage counselling, domestic abuse, personal finances, mental health, well-being and bereavement. With love that provides practical help in the form of furniture, white goods and paying for utilities. All of those activities is to help any member of the local community, irrespective of their belief or ethnicity. I need a drink. <laughs> Nursing home support, where they provide communion services, support activities, and visit individuals at Womble Hall Nursing Home in Norfleet. During COVID, these activities have been replaced with phone calls and letter writing. A prayer centre, where anyone can come in and pray during the week. And through churches together in Gresham, they also support street pastors to ensure that party goers in town centre on Friday and Saturday nights get home safely. School pastors that work with the local schools to provide offending to the children attending. School assemblies and classes which serve the local schools and whose activities form part of the national curriculum. Sanctuary homeless shelter that works closely with Gratian Council to provide overnight accommodation to rough sleepers during November to April. Food Bank, the national charity that offers food to those who need it. The church provides volunteers and issues food vouchers from its offices during the week. Debt counselling that will come through CAP, that's Christians Against Poverty, which will be starting up during the year. The building is also used by a number of local groups, with some that is provided free of charge. Imago, that supports young carers and provides short breaks for disabled children. We Are Beams, a charity set up by local parents of families with disabled children up to the age of 25. Be Bright, that provides extra primary school tuition. Eleanor Hospice, another local charity that makes use of the building. Slimming World, who runs attended sessions on a Saturday morning. Gold Guide Association, where the building is used to host a local troop. U3A, a senior educational charity where members can learn about new skills. And NHS Blood Donations, the church is used regularly to collect blood for the donors. We have also... Right, I'm stopping there. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is, these are all things that we as a church want to do to our local community. If you're not involved, by the way, there's plenty of opportunity to get involved. Or if you've seen something that needs to be done, then why don't you set up a group? Come and have a chat with some of the, the elders and the leaders of the church. We're more than pleased to, to help you and guide you. But the thing is this, is the reason why we do this is so that we can reach a lost world for Jesus Christ. You know, we're not just about doing the good stuff, and, and, and we want to do the good stuff, but we want to reach people. We want to turn them to Jesus. You see, in eternity, I want to see the people in the area celebrating with us in eternity because they found the Lord Jesus. Missions are always ordained by some higher power. Missions start out with prayer, but they start with a recognition that we've seen something that needs to be done. I'd just like to just spend a few minutes talking about a mission that the Lord gave me a number of years ago. It was probably about eight or nine years ago. My mother was, went into a nursing home, um, and she ended up at Womble Hall Nursing Home. And um, to me, if you asked me eight or nine years ago, would you like to work with old people? I'd go, What? <laughs> You know, they're on a different planet. 
even though I'm probably old myself, all right? But it's, <laughs> no, I'm 16 in my head, you know, I'm a youngster, you know. But anyway, my mother went in there, and so I started to go in there. And what I got in there really shocked me. Um, it seemed to me, and it's a personal opinion, it seemed to me that people in the nursing home, by and large, are people that have been dumped by their families. Um, I, I know, you know there are some good reasons why people end up in a nursing home. But a lot of the people I met there um, didn't get visitors. Um, and as so I used to go in there and see my mum, and my mum was suffering from dementia as well, so she could be a bit challenging going in there. And I used to go in there, but one thing I noticed is that there is no spiritual input whatsoever. And so going in there, I really felt, and, and my mum used to say to me, I miss coming to the church. I miss coming to the church. And I got to meet a few other people in there, and they had all been lifelong church members, but once they went into a nursing home, their spiritual life, it seemed, stopped. The church would come and visit for a few weeks or a few months, and then they'd stop visiting. And there they were in this place. And so I said, to, I, and I really felt God say, well, do something about it. And so I thought, what can we do? And so I got together with a few people, Mike, um, Collins and the family. And I said, I wonder if we could go in and do a singing on a Sunday afternoon. Let's just take some of the church and just do a singing. And so I asked um, the, the, the nursing staff there, I said, look, would you mind if we brought a group of people in to sing? Now, they were quite happy because at a weekend, nothing happens on activities. All their activities are Monday to Friday, or that's what they were. So we started going in on a Sunday afternoon. And it, it was a bit strange at first, because there we are singing. There's old Mike, and he's banging out his piano and things, which was great. Um, but what we notice is that other people in the hall, there, was 25, there are 40 bedrooms in one particular house, other people were quite interested and would come and join us. I think they're so bored that they would do anything that had live people in there. I think that was the truth. And so we started, and so once a month, and, and thank you to all of those who came and supported that, we would go in there and we would sing songs. And um, what I found really interesting is that some of the people with severe dementia, when you started singing the old hymns, they would actually start mouthing the words. And there's some connection. You know, we have no idea what the connection and what the Holy Spirit is doing on the inside. But anyway, um, soon later, my mother died. And at that time, I was thinking, I'm glad I don't have to go back to that place again. <laughs> it's not a place I enjoyed visiting. And I thought, I'm, I'm only too glad to be out of here. And I remember on the week my mother died, and I was thinking, Phew, don't have to organize that anymore. And I heard, I really felt God say to me, you've got to keep going back. You've got to go back. And I thought, but I don't want to go back. <laughs> Get back. And, and interesting, one, when I picked up the stuff from my mum, one of the residents said, so I suppose we won't see you again then. And I thought, right, that's not right. So I thought, okay, I'll go back. So we carried on the Sunday services. But then one of the carers came to me and said, look, do you think you could do a communion service during the week? Because a number of residents are asking about communion services. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. <laughs> and, but, you know, I thought, yes, of course I can help. If you see a need, and I'm thinking, if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? It's easy for me to turn around and say, well, ministers of churches can do it. After all, they do nothing else during the week. <laughs> of course, that's not true, by the way. But, but that's the rationale. I'm not a minister. I'm not an ordained minister. So surely they should do it and not me. But I said, no, I'll do it. And I started holding these services. And um, we, I did them every other week. But I got, do you know, I, something happened in my head. I started to really enjoy it. I started, uh, by the, the, the services that I did, the communion services, were full-on gospel services. So almost with a, an altar call at the end. And the thing is, is that when I started doing these services, I found people started asking me questions. So is God really there then? 
how do you know he's really there? And as I started doing you know, the, the communion services, so, so why did Jesus die then? People started asking me those questions. Interestingly, in the alternate weeks, because I did this every fortnight, in the alternate weeks, I would go and do a madcap quiz, all right, because I, I started enjoying myself going there. And the thing is this, is that Michael the Christian and Michael the happy-go-lucky madcap Christian was the same person. And what I found is, is that I was actually able to minister. What then happened, by the way, is that over a number of years, people started asking me more and more. People would actually ask me if I'd come in and pray with them. Um, one um, Christmas, I managed to hire uh, a disabled minibus, and I don't know if you remember, but I brought 10 of them along to the Woodville Halls. Um, and then a couple of them said to them, can we come to your church? And so for a number of years, I used to bring Ron and I used to bring Valerie along to the church. Do you know, those people, Ron was actually a backslidden Christian, but he came back to Christ. Valerie had never, um, you know, as far as I know, ever made a confession, but she made a confession and she became a Christian. And more and more people I noticed, and I'd go and talk to them and I'd, I'd say, look, can I pray for you? Do you know there's a God who loves you? Can I pray for you? Shall we pray? Shall we ask him into your heart? And over the years, quite a few people have come to know God through that. Now, it's not anything that I have done because it's the Holy Spirit that works. I just turned up. And, you know, uh, perhaps the band would like to come forward. Now, as we finish, I just want to say to you is that to reach our neighborhood, we've got to turn up. It's about spotting what, what concerns people just talking and engaging with people, then saying, what can I do to help? You know, everything that we've done, certainly around Wonderful Hall, has been based in prayer. And one thing that I pray is I ask the Lord, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Um, with Wonderful Hall, we, we've, you know, things have had to been put on a back burner because we're not allowed in there. But thank you to those people who've been writing in there. It does make a difference. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to start up that ministry again in that visiting in the next few weeks um, as lockdown end, comes to an end. But I say the challenge, though, is this, is what are, is our mission? You know, one thing that I, I guess drives me on is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 to 8. And this was Paul at the end of his life. He said this, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who longed for his appearing. And one of the things that I guess drives me is that one day I'll face my creator. And I'm sure he'll say to me, so what did you do? What did you do to the people that were surrounded you? You know, sometimes we fear we may fear we may not, we're not up to the mission. But you know, our God, we never go on to missions alone. We're, he's always with us. And when we talk to people, we, we need to be aware that the Holy Spirit is already in that other person working on them. And he will take our words no matter how bad they may be or they may, bad they may sound to us. But he will use those words in order to fulfill his purpose in other people. But what we've got to do is turn up. So hopefully, a message to encourage you to realize that we're all missionaries. We all have different things that God has called us to do. But seek him. Ask him, what's he calling you to do? How can we reach the people in our Judea? Let me just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray, Lord, you take the words that, Lord, you would turn them into action, Father, inside our heads and inside our bodies. Oh, Lord, we long for people to know you. Father, help us to be led by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us courage to speak to our neighbors, the people that are walking down the street. Oh, Father, help us to reach them for you. Lord, we ask this in your holy name. Amen.